Hi, all, and welcome uh, to the Brook and Rails Common Ground. Uh, my name is Anya Bernstein. I'm a production assistant at the Brooklyn Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of your, being your MC today for a conversation between Ixta Murray, Carmina Escobar, Caribbean Fragosa, Amanda Glubizi, and Amber Jamila Musser on how Latina artists keep on keeping on. We're also thrilled to have the poet Angel Dominguez here, who will read to close today's program. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. I want to highlight that the state of New York is currently engaged in a baseless lawsuit against the Shinnecock Nation, and I'll drop a link in the chat if you want to learn more and contribute to their cause. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McGatty, James Skurlock, Jamil Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., Casey Goodson and countless others we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. We would like to remember and honor the life of Brandon Bernard who was executed by the state after spending more than half of his life on death row. We acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our guests, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's guests. Carmina Escobar is an extreme vocalist and intermedia artist with an active teaching practice. Born in Mexico and based in Los Angeles, Escobar investigates and expresses emotions, politics, states of alienation, and the possibilities of interpersonal connection through voice performances that challenge our understandings of musicality, gender, queerness, race, the spoken word, and the foundations of human connection, communication. Her work, Fiesta Perpetua, a Comunitas Ritual of Manifestation, was included in Pacific Standard Time, LA, LA, Los Angeles. Her new project with Michaela Tobin, Howl Space, is a virtual hub offering individualized teaching sessions, workshops, and salons. The daughter of Mexican immigrants, Caribbean Fragosa was raised in South El Monte, California. Her fiction and nonfiction have appeared in numerous publications, including Bomb, Guisache, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. She is alumna of the Creative Writing MFA program at Cal Arts. Fragosa co-edited East of East, The Making of Greater El Monte, published February 2020 by Rutgers University Press. Her forthcoming debut collection of fiction, Eat the Mouth That Feeds You, will be published by City Lights in March of 2021. She is senior writer at the Trop Tropics of Meta, co-editor of UC Press's acclaimed California cultural journal, Boom California, and is also the founder of South El Monte Arts Posse, an interdisciplinary arts collective. Caribbean is currently the coordinator of the Kingsley and Kate Tufts Poetry Award at Claremont Graduate University, and she lives in the San Gabriel Valley in LA County. Ixta Maya Murray is a writer and law professor living in Los Angeles. Her most recent works are the forthcoming novel, Art is Everything, the short story collection, The World Doesn't Work That Way, But It Could, and the play, Advice and Consent. Her fiction has appeared in Plowshares, The Georgia Review, The Southern Review, and The Los Angeles Review of Books. She has won a Whiting Writers Award and an Art Writers Grant, and she has been a finalist for the ASME Award in Fiction. Her art criticisms can be found in Art Forum, Art News, Artillery, and other periodicals. Amanda Glubizi is an art scene editor at the Brooklyn Rail. An art historian, she is the co-director of the New Foundation for Art History and the author of Art and Design in 1960s New York. Dr. Amber Jamila Moser is a professor of American Studies at George Washington University. She writes about race, sexuality, and aesthetics. She is the author of Sensational Flesh, Race, Power, and Masochism, and Sensual Excess, Queer Femininity, and Brown Jouissance. 
She has an MST in Women's Studies from Oxford University and received her PhD in History of Science from Harvard University and has held fellowships at New York University's Draper Program in Gender Studies and Brown University's Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. She also writes art criticism for the Brooklyn Rail. So without further ado, Ixta, uh, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I want to thank Anya, Amber, Amanda, Carmina, Caribbean, the Brooklyn Rail so much, and everyone who has uh, attended today uh, for talking about uh, Latina artists keeping on, uh, keeping on. So I uh, thought that we should gather uh, to talk about this subject um, because it has pr proved such a motivating factor in my own work. I myself stopped making art for about five or six years and stopped publishing altogether for about nine years, starting around in uh, 2008. I suffered a couple of setbacks, um, health setbacks, as well as I was sexually assaulted by my publisher. And I just felt like I couldn't make art anymore. And so I stopped and I pivoted um, to other endeavors, but it was very painful. And I never stopped thinking about my decision and uh, about, and I started to think a lot about why women of color artists uh, might stop making work um, for reasons that are related uh, to their uh, identities. And I was made to think a lot about uh, the famous essay of Linda Nochlin, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists, famously published in 1971 where Nochlin wrote that the fact of the matter is that there have been no supremely great women artists as far as we know, although there have been many interesting and very good ones who remain insufficiently investigated or appreciated. I thought that Nochlin was wrong and that there are many great women artists and we know that, but what I worried about uh, were women of color artists who had stopped in the practice. And these questions eventually led me uh, to begin writing my forthcoming book, which is titled Art is Everything. And what you see here is the beautiful image of Rosa Rolando, of Rolanda Atorretrato, her self-portrait of 1952. And what I'm gonna begin with is a reading uh, from the book, um, which is a meditation um, about the work of Rosa Rolanda, a sometime, in some ways little known artist, she deserves a lot more uh, 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 fame than she currently has. And so I'm gonna read this portion, uh, which is a portion of my book, which is about this image. So it's written, it's, the, it's purported to be an essay written by an artist who has stopped making art after being sexually assaulted by her gallerist. So I'll, I'll start as follows. In 1970, the former artist Rosa Rolanda died of undetermined causes in Mexico City. Rolanda had an active art practice in her 30s, 40s, and 50s. Then it appears that she stopped making art altogether, a catastrophe that few people noticed. A perusal of Rolanda's scattered archives reveals that her work output began to dwindle in the 1950s before collapsing entirely sometime in the 1960s. In 1960, Rolanda was just 65 years old. 65 years old is too early for an artist to ret retire, particularly if you think about the obscenely long career of Pablo Picasso, for example. He ceased painting and sculpting just weeks before he died of congestive heart failure at the age of 91. Rolanda's farewell to the art world also compares embarrassingly to the enduring triumphalism of the portraitist John Singer Sargent, who still made exquisite charcoal drawings in 1925, the same year that he died at the age of 69, also of heart disease. Actually, this essay could go on to list hundreds of celebrated artists who have made copious amounts of work throughout their lives, most of these old masters being white, typically male. Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Julian Schnabel, Goya, Claude Monet, Joseph Boys, Pollock, Rodin, Donatello, Duchamp, as well as the exceptional Louise Bourgeois, Maritza Mertz, Mary Cassatt, Lee Bontecou, George O'Keefe, Helen Frankenthaler. But this essay is supposed to be about the Mexican American female artist, Rosa Rolanda, and so perhaps we should stop there. Rosa Rolanda was a woman of color who evidently stopped making art in her seventh decade, and we would like to know why. 
People who are ignorant might suggest that Rolanda quit the struggle because she had a nervous breakdown after her husband abandoned her for a teenaged ballerina around 1952. Rolanda's husband was the renowned polymath and world traveler, Miguel Covarrubias, who never stopped painting epic murals of Pacific Islanders, sketching lively caricatures of the glitterati for Vanity Fair, and generally being famous. That is, he didn't stop until he had to. Miguel Covarrubias died in February 1957, at the age of 53, of what the New York Times called septicemia, a blood poisoning, in its dithyrambic obituary. Miguel Covarrubias enjoyed a tenacious art, pract art practice, like Picasso and Sargent and Boys and Goya and Frankenthaler. Mere months before he contracted septicemia, he made a solemn black and white lithograph titled Man and Woman, which now hangs in the Art Institute of Chicago. Though it is difficult to know the precise contours of Rosa Rolanda's career arc because so few scholars have paid attention to it, a tiny tribe of heroic art historians have tried to reconstruct her efforts. From their writings, we learned that Rolanda's work habits deliquesced from a rigorously maintained art regimen into a fugue of angsty dabbling whose early onset arrived shortly after she painted her remarkable 1952 self-portrait, Autoretrato. The lavish yet melancholy Autoretrato shows Rolanda holding her head and freaking out because she is surrounded by lithe dancers and skeletons, which are unsubtle references to her husband's baby-skinned ballerina girlfriend and the way that time destroys our dreams and our lives. Readers of this unsolicited essay will see that Rolanda's attractive avatar appears in the center of the canvas, wearing a green dress and a fashionable red scarf. The figure possesses giant greenish alien-like eyes and an unsmiling mouth. Some of the dancers tangle in her dark hair, perhaps in a complicated reference to the Rodgers and Hammerstein hit song, I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair from the musical South Pacific. Rolanda reaches up and paws at her head, attempting to wash out the dancer demons, but failing to succeed. And so she just stares balefully at the viewer. Other dancers spill out across the canvas, leaping and cavorting around a few other troubling symbols, like an unringing telephone, wee skulls, and a ticking clock. Auto Retrato is a sad painting and a fine one too. And in hindsight, we might read it as a harbinger of the letdowns to come. At the beginning of her art career, though, it seemed like Rolanda's future was full of promise and that everything would turn out really good and not in tears and failure. Rolanda began her professional life as a dancer when she fled her boring hometown of Azusa, California and began can-canning on Broadway at the age of 16. Her life as a visual artist flowered shortly after 1925, which is when she met Covarrubias, moved with him to Mexico, and began taking photographs under the tutelage of Edward Weston. During this period, she experimented with the rhyograph technique invented by Man Ray and her resulting still lifes of apples, lace, crystal, and skyscrapers radiate with intense inky blacks and starry whites, as well as display Rolanda's exquisite flair for composition. Few of these pictures sold, however. As the feminist art critic Don Ades has noted in Wonderland, the surrealist adventures of women artists in Mexico and the United States, Rolanda's experiments with photograms seem to have remained unknown during her lifetime. Perhaps they found no natural outlet because their experimental look did not fit with the dominantly realist styles of Mexicanidad. Rolanda dealt with this fiasco by moving on to gouache into 1926, commencing a career that would see her painting glamorous movie stars like Dolores Del Rio, an ever more, interest, ever more interesting progression of self-portraits that would culminate in the fabulously disturbing autoretrato and then diminish into meh and okay paintings of orchids until she appears to have ceased making art entirely. After that, the glimpses of Rolanda that we can espy in Coravuvias and Western biographies indicate that she directed her energies into hosting large, ambitiously catered parties for celebrity friends and staring forlornly at the wall. And that's the end of my reading. I'll now move uh, or hand over uh, the mic uh, to Caribbean. Thank you so much. 
Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here. I'm super lucky and blessed. Um, thank you, Itzta, for helping putting this together and Carmina for joining us. And thank everybody at Brooklyn Rail also for hosting us. Um, it's such an important conversation, not one that we get to have very often. So uh, again, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity. Um, so I have uh, just two images to show very quickly, and then I'm gonna read my short or an excerpt from my short story called Tor Tortillas Burning from my short story collection that I'll talk about in a second. This is the cover of my book that just came out, well, earlier this year in February, it's not just, it's been a few months, but it happened right as the pandemic was breaking out. Uh, this is uh, not a book of fiction, but a collection of essays that I co-edited with uh, several of my co-editors, including my husband, Romeo Guzman, and it's about my hometown in El Monte. So in addition to being a fiction writer, I am also, um, as you heard in my bio, an editor and the director of an arts collective. And I sort of have my, my hands and legs and feet and all of my body parts and um, in, in different aspects of creativity and making work. And one of the things that I admire so much about Ixta, and I just have to say it for the world to hear, is that I admire so much how she does different things. I mean, she's uh, she works in academia, she writes fiction, which is how I first came to know her as an undergrad at UCLA reading Locas. And, um, and then she writes about art and culture, which is what I do. So I find a kindred spirit and a kind of sisterhood in Ixta. So I, I, um, I just wanted to point that out because as we think about Latinas making work and, and then maybe not making work, I think it's valuable to think about what else we're doing when we're not maybe necessarily making the visible work of, of art and um, how we dip in and out of different things. And we wear a lot of different hats. And um, maybe that's really valuable in ways that we haven't been able to talk about. Um, I'm a mother as well. I have two young daughters, a nine-year-old and a one-year-old. I have a baby. And um, that's a really important hat that I wear. But, um, and sometimes when I'm not making work like I am right now, I'm, I'm being a mom. And um, I'm also processing what that means and what that means to my, my creative uh, work. In the next image, if we could show that, is the cover of my uh, forthcoming short story collection, Eat the Mouth That Feeds You, uh, published by City Lights, uh, who I love. I adore them um, and their legacy. And Eat the Mouth That Feeds You, um, I, want, I really wanted to show off the cover because I think it's gorgeous. And it's also by another woman artist that I totally admire and that's Graciela Iturbide, who you may be familiar with. She's a fantastic Mexican photographer and has had tremendous influence on my writing uh, as well. So um, the, the short story that I'm gonna read, Tortillas Burning, is from a collection uh, of uh, narratives and voices of different Latina women um, that are having to deal with and survive different kinds of, um, I would say catastrophes in their lives. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about, especially since the outbreak of the pandemic, and then also reflecting on the last four years since 2016, when uh, 45 was, uh, uh, suddenly part of our lives in all these horrific ways um, is how, how as women of color um, and, and as Latinas in particular, we experience catastrophe, historical catastrophe and personal catastrophe. And how, how does that um, as, as uh, artists and creative people affect our work and how does it stop it or how does it feed it? Uh, and these are questions that, I, that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and this character that I'm about to um, um, introduce you to, um, she asks a lot of these questions or they're sort of underlying in her perspective. And I work through a lot of these questions that I have as Caribbean Fragosa through my characters. Although usually the characters come first and they're asking those questions before I am consciously as Caribbean. Um, 
So this story that I'm about to read, or it's just an excerpt, um, was written before the pandemic started, but I was already starting to think about catastrophe and what does it mean to be a Latina and especially the child of immigrants where we're expected of others and of ourselves to progress, to do better than the previous generation and, um, and expect that the generations that come after us to, to progress also in some kind of linear fashion. And I've come to realize that that is a myth. It doesn't work that way um, because of the way the world is. So without further ado, um, I'll read just a few minutes from Tortillas Burning and then uh, we'll pass it over to Carmina. So, Tortillas Burning. <clears throat> when you've got nothing else, you'll always have at least a tortilla to get you through. Learn to use them. Take a tortilla, an old one that's gone hard and hold it over a flame. Watch the tortilla blacken and break. Take those ashes when you have nothing else. Take the ashes and rub them onto your teeth with your fingers, smudge them, scrub them over your gums, all over inside your mouth. Con un buche de agua, rinse and spit it into the ground. Rinse very well, lest anyone confuse you with a witch. La gente es bien pendeja, like, they don't know the brujas are often the most beautiful. Careful with the bonitas, I say. One minute, they are the sweetest pair of honeyed calves dripping down the street, and the next, they are owls beating the night air. But not us, not too pretty, though we have our gifts. We keep our teeth clean, our floors swept, the things my grandmother used to say. I often wonder what kind of situation would require me to burn a tortilla to clean my teeth. When might I be without basic items like toothpaste or bath soap so that I'd have to find some elemental alternative to perform simple personal hygiene? It was hard to imagine what kind of thing might happen to knock you back to where your grandmother had been. It's a wonder, even to me now, how I ended up on that pig farm. I wasn't meant for farm life, you know. Good at math, I was still going to high school and everything, kept my socks up, but my skirt short like all the other girls playing hooky on the malecon whenever we were sure we'd get away with it. My own mother, que en paz descanse, was no saint, just normal, like me, like every other girl from the beginning of time. No smarter, no more stupid, no more decent or holy as folks would have you believe. But when you're a girl of 17 and a man, young and handsome, looks you in the eye, serious, unlike the clowns you grew up with, and he tells you to marry him, well, you think, why not? Here's a man, like a door instead of a hole or a rope, formal and upright but I didn't think to ask where I'd end up on the other side of that door. He was opaque that way, didn't give many clues, but I should have known better with all the dust that covered him. That dust, that's where I went, a place full of dust. Americans think Mexico is green and lush, a big resort hotel and a pyramid in a jungle by the sea. Well, why wouldn't they? They just jump on their American airline and off they go, skipping over everything, the dust and the rocks, the farms and the factories. They arrive at Cancun or Puerto Vallarta with their shoes clean and find an ocean fit for a white bikini. Or that's what I've heard. I haven't returned since. The dust is what I most remember about living on the farm. Dust everywhere, always. One spends the day at home trying to keep the tile clean when it might just as well have been made of dirt. You can imagine, sweeping and sweeping, dusting and dusting, nothing ever gets clean. Polvo eres y en polvo te convertirás. Every day was Ash Wednesday, somber and ashy with doom marked upon you, no matter how bright the sun. It was this life pressed upon my forehead every year of my childhood. A letter from God, his sinister plan, always there waiting for me, and I'd finally arrived to it. As a girl, laughing and sneaking drinks with the boys, 
It was hard to believe the Sunday litanies or the abuelita threats. But then one day, you're Alicia following a white rabbit down the hall or through a door. It was always there waiting for you. Bienvenida. This is your país now. These are your maravillas. So thank you very much. I'll pause right there. And um, I'm happy to introduce Carmina, who you will adore. So Carmina, thank you for joining us. Oh, Caribbean, I'm so happy. I haven't seen, like, I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you, Ista. Thank you, everyone. This is a lovely, it's a lovely space that it's being created right now. And I'm really, really grateful um, to be here and to have these discussions and to be with wonderful people that I admire and love uh, and I feel very supported by. So, and that's everything, that's community. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about my practice. I don't come from writing, I'm a performer. I come from Mexico City, um, uh, the daughter of a, a professor so of, a, of um, uh, middle education level. Um, and, but I, I was the alien in the family and continued to do um, music. I come from essentially from music. Uh, but then my practice has focused a lot regarding my main instrument, which is the voice. So I just wanted to show a little bit of pieces that, I'm, that I've worked with just to, just to give like a, a frame of references. Um, this for example is called Masajam Sonora. And I always like to show this piece because um, it really makes a reference of what I believe uh, the capabilities of the voice are. I work with the voice, but I understand the voice not as language because it carries language, but it's not language. Uh, it's an, of, a, 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 an object of aesthetic pleasure, but it's uh, through music, but it's not that. So what it is, like the voice is always being referred sort of like this ontological thing about, about humans. And um, so in this piece it's called Sonic Massage. Um, and, and in a way, what I'm trying to explore uh, with this is um, the, the, the geographic uh, resonance that we have into, to really connect because the voice, one of the many things that it is, is that it's relational. It allows you to place yourself in the world. It allows you to know the distance through the acoustics and the production of it, of the spaces around you, of your limits, of you with the other. And um, so I try to explore the voice in this many, in, 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 in many um, variations and always conceptually is the seat. Uh, and, uh, but also how can you expand it through different media being like electronics or installation or performance uh, or different genres of music. And this piece in particular, like I really, I, I really like it because it really entails that, that uh, the, the ethos that I, that I also have a lot in my work, which is, um, the voice as a relational tool to connect with each other. So this piece I, I um, developed it in 2010 in a residency in, um, in Portugal, in which I was just trying to test my voice and like what were the resonant frequencies uh, uh, with different spaces. And then I started thinking about the human body and I just put a little sign and the people will have to engage with me. And then we will make a verbal contract in which like um, I would state, uh, if, um, I would ask them if I could touch them. And if they said, yes, they're doomed. And then I developed this technique in which you create this resonant cavity here. And then you start singing in the body, um, which like, uh, I mean, I've done different pieces that has to do with proximity, but this in particular has always triggered something very, 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 primal I feel because it, it always is never it has never been um something that you don't care about it's always been an experience either a profound one or just like just an experience of resonance uh, because what it means to resonance that we're about with my voice is vibrating uh, uh is making your bones vibrate at the same frequency so we are together together in this space and I feel that it it, it triggers a lot of uh primordial things because our first experience in the world is through through vibration in the womb of our mothers we don't see anything we're just feeling this vibration so so understanding this voice then as this relational tool um and i've done it uh, ever since in many different places which also allows me to investigate in a way like um gender politics like uh, the fact that i'm being allowed like even as a latino but my clear skin also gives certain facilities that and also um to see how like people really engage, uh, what is the sense of touch? So it's, it's like many different levels, but the, the main one is, is this touching. And then in that sense, talking about um, different pieces um, or understanding the voice, expanding it through different media. This is another piece that I, that I made a couple of years ago, 
which is called replicant, which I try to recreate a meta instrument using the mechanism of, of the voice, uh, breath, the glottostops, the cavities, to create um, an instrument that will not, uh, th through the mechanisms of my voice, not produce my voice, but control the voices of the other. So I made a study of like different emotional uh, 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 faces, and then I had um, I had a, a camera that would like recognize certain gestures and then trigger certain things. And I had a contact microphone and a and a, and a microphone that I I will uh, control the archive of voices that I would have to manipulate a four a four channel channel installation again, like trying to uh, understand the voice not only as this. Um, because the voice is, 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 is the most unescapable expression of human individuality, according to, to Cavarero, a wonderful uh, Italian uh, philosopher. But it also expresses where you come from and the collectivity and the places that you are. Like it's a sonic trace of who you are. That's why, that's why in a way, like I find so profound the, the whole idea and experience of the voice because it goes into like what things are. And maybe it's also a candy for me because that's, that's the, base, the basis of my practice. So you see like, that's how I'm like connecting to all these sensors and then I'm just um, triggering things that you cannot hear there. And then um, uh, another kind of piece is like uh, Fiesta Perpetua, again, like in the sense of like relational, how do you relate to the space and like knowing, uh, I, I was asked to do a piece by Machine Project, um, uh, uh, a series uh, that, that would relate to the Echo Park Lake. So I, because I am from Mexico and um, I do believe in the third and I, I um, syncretism is a thing for me that it's very important because through the, through like a really violent clashing, you create this third that may not make sense, but it's sort of like, but it, it allows you to discover these different things about identity. So I, I did this piece that it was called Fiesta Perpetua, uh, uh, a communitas ritual of manifestation because communitas is a community that is made by different communities, which at the end it also like challenge like the idea of like the melting pot in the state, which I do not believe in because the melting is just like this blending of things. But this having these identities that can, then can uh, and these different voices and can coexist. So working with them, we did a series of uh, interventions during a day from like dawn to so sunrise to sunset. And these interventions will uh, triangulate the space in water with like some wraps. And I had these uh, megaphones and, um, and it was just, it was just a part. It was a lot of improvisation. It's a, it's a way more complex piece, but I, this, this one leads me to this other piece because I also like to recycle things. <laughs> so those megaphones, what ended up happening in this January before the, uh, the pandemic is that we put one in the, with the Mexicali Biennial. We put uh, one in Calexico and one in Mexicali and we were just sending, sending message to each other because again, like the, the capabilities of sound, the political ca capabilities of sound are so powerful. Like you can pass those vibration and those are free. So we were sending each other messages. So again, like just wanted to, um, to exemplify a little bit um, um, how is that like through years of practice with the voice, I sort of try to, um, to see all the, not only expressive capabilities, but conception capabilities and, and, and experiential possibilities. Uh, again, like uh, when we were talking about, um, I, I listened to them like talking really profoundly about um, how do you keep doing the work? And I do feel like great responsibility and a duty of like, as an, as an artist, of trying to find these different ways of connecting to each other. Um, I don't have kids, um, um, but I'm, I hustle, <laughs> like there's no other. Um, and, and in a way, uh, that sense of, that sense of um, and I feel, I feel like, like when you don't have any other choice other than to keep on going, you just keep on going. It's a privilege that is not a great privilege to be able to, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, in, in the sense that like when catastrophe happens, like catastrophe is happening all the fucking time. But if you've never been exposed to it, then it go, it's gonna incapacitate you. And also working with these different communities, you learn that like stopping is a privilege and it's not a good one. So like I have that thing, especially right now during the pandemic, because at the beginning I'm a, I'm a performer. So I did went through a period of depression of high depression because I feed on like the experience that I create with musicians, with audience, 
And um, so that was gone. But then it's like, so how do we do, how do we, how do we find ways? Like it's our duty to find ways. And in a way also this, this project that, um, that was, they, they talk about in my bio called House Space, it was brewing way before the pandemic, but then it took more sense uh, as the pandemic arrived. Um, one of my Cosmic Sisters, uh, a colleague, Michaela Tobin, an incredible singer and an incredible artist and composer, um, we decided to also, that we were struggling a lot, like financially, Los Angeles is an expensive place to be, but it's an exciting place to be too, um, that we needed to find joyous ways to find uh, sustainability. So we created this radical pedagogical hub called House Space, in which we give voice lessons, workshops, and we have voice salons. Um, and these voice salons, uh, uh, these are free for the audience, but we just had our second one, which was incredible with Asher Hartman and Jose Luis Blondet and Karen Lovegren and Justin Nasher talking about the voice multiverse. One is psychic, one is a curator that talks about ventriloquism. Uh, one is a sculpture that like, has this anim um, deep work with voice with the sculptures and a sound engineer. So like, how do you create these like conversations that can be really interesting and explore this theme that this, this, this thing, this voice. Um, and also we give workshops. Um, and again, all of this is to create this joyous, um, joyous um, sustainability because that's the other thing is like, how do you create an, a space in which you can do what you want in which you can also, we both work at an institution that shall not be named, <laughs> but it's really gnarly. And, um, and, and in, it's still as open as it is, like it's still like the constructs of authority and, and so on like are very present. And we do believe that process uh, before product and art before technique, because art is gonna lead you to technique. So we developed a series of workshops. We did once for our launching, one was the megaphonic voice because we also wanted to have interjection and like with reality. So we created the megaphonic voice, which was this um, workshop uh, because we saw that in the, in, when the, the when the protests were ha protests were happening, um, the, the people were like getting really, really messed up in the in their throats. So then we wanted to contribute to the toolkit for for protests. So we gave these these workshops to learn how to scream. And another one that we did was the one is in togetherness because one of the other things that we were feeling through the pandemic is like to be in this space and with this acoustic and we like we don't know it was really hard to be in this this thing. So we created this sort of like. Uh, quoting on um, uh, Paulino Oliveros, sonic meditations, like to do that kind of work. So what I wanted to do with you, if you if you will allow me, uh, is just to be, give a really quick uh, sonic meditation um, in which like one of the other things is like trying to figure out ways of connecting to each other. Uh, I work in a lot with Asher Hartman, who's an incredible uh, experimental state stage director and psychic we were also we developed this like cover show no long ago and again it was like this thing that I was sort of complaining about um how do you like like pass this like how do you connect and the thing is like yes there's there's ways to connect and even though they sound super sci-fi there's there's ways to like transport each other in this space so if you allow me uh we can do like this um this um this meditation uh just to traverse the space. So, but again, like we listen, we sound with our body and we listen with our body. And in order to be receptive to that, uh, we need to, um, to really open it up for it. So if you are willing, you don't have to, but if you're willing, uh, just sit on the ed edge of the chair that you're at and like plant your feet really well. And let's do a couple of circles with our head to one side to the other, very good. And now just like take your hands and massage here really gently. Just feeling how your lower back stretches. Very good. And now contrary movement without clenching the cervicals. We just open, 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 open and relax. And check it, 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 check it. And a couple of circles with your shoulders to the back just to open up the torso where our lungs reside, where we breathe and out to the front. Very good. And inhale deep, tension to your ears and exhale. Very good, one more, one more. And exhale. And in the next one, 
you're gonna close your eyes. And I want you to concentrate on the weight of your body in the chair or on the surface that you're sitting on. Feel the connection of your feet to the floor. And now concentrate on the entrance of air into your body and the exit of this air of your body in this eternal rhythm. If you cannot feel it, just place your hand gently on your stomach and feel the rise and the let go. Very good. Now shift your attention to the sounds around you, the closest, the ones in your room. Slowly turn your head towards the right and concentrate on the sounds coming to your right ear. Slowly turn your head towards the left and shift your attention to the sounds coming to your left ear. Let go of that focus and center your head. Go back into feeling the entrance and exit of air in your body. Very good. Now concentrate on the sounds farthest from you, the ones outside of your room. And slowly bring your attention more and more to the sounds in your room. And slowly, Listen to my voice and come into my room. Hi, you are in my room. Listen to my voice. You are in my room. Listen to my voice. Softly, start humming with me. It can be the same sound or it can be any other. Just hum with me in my room. Last time. Go back into your room and listen to the sounds around you. Shift your attention to the weight of your body and the surface you're sitting on. Concentrate on the sensation of the air coming in and out of your body. And slowly open your eyes. Welcome <laughs> into your space. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I pass the microphone to someone. <laughs> so thank you so much, Carmina and Caribbean and Ixta. Um, 
I feel, I feel amazing <laughs> right now. This is wonderful. Um, so one of the things that we did before we prepared for this um, in person is that we, we had some questions that we wanted to think about. And so uh, this is something that Ixta sent out to us a couple of weeks ago. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about these. Um, the, the big question here about keeping on, keeping on, um, what are the challenges that uh, Latinx performers, artists, writers face as you're trying to make work and to keep on keeping on? If I might, if I may. Please. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. great. Um, yeah, wonderful, wonderful presentations from both um, Caribbean and Carmina, thank you so much. But in terms of the obstacles, uh, there, are so, there are so many. The, the question is how to process them. In the last few years, we've been looking at this tide of explicit, vocalized racial hatred and violence that has been difficult to shut off, at least for me personally. Um, it's like a constant film reel that I continually play and that I, and I'm trying to draw from, but sometimes it can be destructive. And then there's also the problems with lack of access. Just on December 11th, the New York Times uh, issued a report and a study saying that they did an analysis of uh, fiction books published by major houses between 1950 and 2018. And they, they estimated that about 5% of those books were, of fiction were published by writers of color. So it's just, it's just a lack of, of lack of, of platform, of traditional platforms. And then in 2016, CUNY issued a study that said, uh, that concluded that 80.5% um, of artists represented in New York galleries were white and 30% uh, were female and they didn't do a woman of color artist breakdown. They didn't do a intersectional breakdown. So these are just some of the, the obstacles uh, that we face, um, but uh, Carmina and Caribbean have also talked about others. Emotional upheaval um, in the case of um, Carmina and then also balancing uh, family and work. So, oh, so um, maybe uh, we can also talk about those things as well. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like there's so many different way, uh, avenues for us to explore. I think one of the things that came up for me um, among all three of your presentations, which were so um, wonderful, was really thinking about um, the relationship between endurance and resilience. Um, and especially, I think we have a tendency to aestheticize the endurance practices of artists of color, especially. Um, and I'm wondering with this question of sort of when does art stop and sort of what does it take to keep going, right? Like how that intersects with those two I don't even know what to call them, concepts or, or ideas, right? Because there is a point at which endurance is maybe not enough um, or maybe, you know what I mean? Like there's sort of a pressure to keep going, um, but maybe that is in times of catastrophe. I mean, to talk to that, because there's something that I've been thinking a lot. I mean, you have stamina at a certain point in your life, but after 35, it gets real. <laughs> like the body gets like tired and, so what I discover with that, because yes, like um, as a just a female in Mexico or whatever, it's like there the misogyny is real, even though you can, and um, how they work they pay, and pay everything get distributed is, is messed up. And you are thinking you're coming in this place and like, oh, we're in this artistic space. And, but no, it is, it's like painfully, painfully, painfully real. And, and then when you're like trying to make things happen in this space and you're in the hustle of like, Keeping, keeping, keeping working. Because again, to me, it's not an, it's not an option. And the more that I grew older, then less of an option to, to stop. Not just, um, not just to keep on going frantically, but like to not lose the eye of like keeping wanting to do beautiful, meaningful things. But the thing is, like, you cannot do it on your own. And that's why I was saying that I feel like really, really, really supported. I love Ixta. It's like a great support of my work. Like she has written like so deep and beautiful. And in that sense of like having that support system, what I come to find out is like, and again, it's not a very, um, I don't know, I don't even know how to call it if it's masculine, feminine or what, but it's to create a sustainability network 
with people that believe and that you believe in them and respect and love. And that's that's it, the way that I'm trying to focus. And again, like that's why like house space is it's a communal space and it's a it's a, it's an endeavor made with my sister. And then other projects that are coming up is is trying to figure out that support system because. And, and create it for yourself because it's not going to come from uh, like like yes if you're not white male and 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 rich it's harder for us fucking sure so how do you how you to break that cycle i think it's through creating that 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 sense of community and that like like teamwork that you are supporting them and they're supporting you so because this is, is something it's a model that i've been thinking the more that i grow older and the more that i get tired about doing like administration cooking creating performing blah, 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 it's like it's like impossible it's impossible to keep it to keep it at that level you know what an what an incredible answer i can uh, that resonates so much with me and just just to keep on the theme, Caribbean has just told me that she's been suddenly evacuated from her building, which is why I don't know if uh, Anya, if you've received that message from her. So uh, trying to keep doing this work, how can you do it when you've been evacuated from your building? It becomes a little more challenging. So I'm asking, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I don't know if Anya, do, if you have her uh, phone number so that you can text her and maybe see if we can get her on the phone or maybe she just needs a moment uh, to collect herself. But um, uh, so, so sorry, so, Am so Amber, your question is such a great one. And Serena, I see here in the group chat uh, is, is thinking about when endurance can be harmful. And in my experience, um, when I'm, I'm trying to fulfill some kind of model, of that's been prefabricated for me for what artistic productivity and success looks like, then sometimes that can be really inspiring and get me part of the way. But once that stops um, feeding me, if I keep going back to that well, I, I'm really just operating within a, a, a group of rules that have been set um, Ha, that, that has been set up by people other than me. And so learning how to create your own rules and, and as uh, Carmina is talking about and relying on community uh, to help think about uh, those rules. Like maybe I don't need to publish with the, this type of publisher. Maybe I don't need to publish in this type of journal. Maybe I don't need to publish right now at all. Maybe I can think about new different practices or as Caribbean was talking about, maybe I need to reframe what this space means. Endurance can be harmful. And it's for me, it's typically been when I'm trying to fulfill some kind of stereotype of what, uh, what trying to be a Jackson Pollock instead of the Nixta Maya Murray, right? That's when I get hurt, it seems. Well, one of the, one of the times that I get hurt. So I hope that answers your question. Do you find that you turn to art making therapeutically or do you think that turning to art making therapeutically is, is somewhat dangerous? Great, so um, it's good to see that hopefully Caribbean will be able to come back into this conversation. So, so I used to think that making art therapeutically was really dangerous and I was gonna turn it into uh, a therapy session or a blankie or a teddy bear and that that was going to hurt my ability to do the kind of work that would be able to communicate to the types of people that I wanted to. Um, but I now know that as an artist, you can do different types of work for different types of purposes. Not, not everything has to be for the gallery, not everything. Maybe it'll turn into a show. Maybe it'll turn into quote unquote something. But I do now know that um, doing something so-called small in a small context uh, may be necessary to get to the next step. And also it's okay to just not to, to worry about it so much. It's, it's okay just to, 
to put some color on a paper uh, to, to heal yourself. They're different, art is like God, it's, it's everything. Uh, and it can be, you can do it for lots of different purposes. That's what I now think. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, I, I mean, I, I do my therapy apart and I draw for my therapy because I do believe like to me, art has to be a, a, like any sort of like a struggle. It has to be aestheticized for it to transcend just the raw, the rawness of like therapy. So, so yes, therapeutic, yeah, based before me. And then it's, and then it seeps into the world not to heal me, but like to find the bigger things or like the things that I want to investigate for me in that sense of therapeutic. But then appealing to what Ixta was saying about, and again, these are like, these are like, this is authority talking about like, oh, like it should be like for this or for that, or you should be part of like, I mean, those things are so poisonous. And I'm part of a collective in Los Angeles that is called Beta Level. It's, it's just, it's, I mean, it, it's a, it's a basement in Chinatown and it's a bunch of nerdy friends and I, but like the most wonderful, one of like the most beautiful, like artistic experience making sound, it's been there and it's free. Like you just drink and you're together. And, and, and again, it's like, it's like life as art, um, not as product, which is, is, is a thing that I like, uh, like the system wants to inculcate, okay, like the, the, the personality, the oneness, like do you have to be the star? And then it has to have, but so, but those are constructs that are very oppressive then. And then it functions, so, so I do believe in like shifting the, 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 the sense of like what it should be or what the models are there for you. And then creating alternative, alternative models, like finding these different ways of connecting. And again, it's like the most beautiful experiences. And I, I have made zero money. I, have put money to buy beers for everyone <laughs> and just like have a, a and then but, but then it becomes this other this other journey and also it might be different because I come more from the performing arts and that's kind of like a, in a music which is not I mean it's commodifiable in pop but when you're doing experimental music it's not like contemporary art and a painting it will disappear in the ethos so the economy of it is very different also so I don't know if that also is like implying there, but um, but yeah, but therapy is good before, and then it seeps into the art to get aestheticized. Amber, do you have another question, or would you like yeah. me to go? I have another question, yeah. um, and I think it's actually getting to something that Caribbean said um, in her presentation, which is kind of about the the sort of the other things that one is doing. Um, and I'm sort of curious how it intersects with what Carmina was just saying about kind of the building of community and sort of the, the sort of like this other scaffolding, right? And sort of like the multiple virtues of, of um, I guess like not necessarily being the singular being. Um, it's often looked upon as detrimental, right? Like you are not serious to only be doing this. Um, and just sort of, I guess I just wanted uh, to see if you guys could elaborate more on um, not only the perils, but sort of like the benefits of that kind of structuring. Um, can I jump in for a second? Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. The, the fire alarm went off. I didn't see a fire, thank God, but I just had to run out of the building <laughs> and I ran home. So I'm so out of shape. <laughs> I was like dying. Um, so related to the question that you just, um, the idea that you just brought up. I'm thinking, am I the only one hearing this music? Do you guys hear it? Yeah, yeah. I can talk, but then I'll just have some background music going on. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, community. Um, I find it really distracting to talk with this music. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Is it possible? Oh, it's gone now, I think. <laughs> Where was that? And I need to it. I can help Caribbean with her mic if, if you all want to keep it going. Uh, okay, okay, great. In the meantime. So so we're talking about um, 
different, having different identities or different facets of our lives. And uh, whether that's enervating, if it's, uh, if it draws off power from us, or if there can be times, am I, am I getting uh, correct, uh, Amber, or whether it can uh, encourage us or enrich us? Right. I mean, it's not necessarily like an either or, but just mm -hmm. sort of um, how that, how conceptualizing of yourself in these multiple ways impacts what you're doing. Right. Um, I just want to make sure that Caribbean is not ready to talk. Caribbean, are you ready to answer? Otherwise, I will talk. Okay. Um, I, I so I teach law as well as write fiction, and I have I have uh, for many years regarded these as separate endeavors. And um, I uh, they jostled and competed with with one another, and um, so I didn't really see them as being synchronous or helping one another. And, but it's in the last few years uh, that I've decided to start writing fiction in law review uh, journals and start writing fiction about law. And um, that's an atypical route to take, particularly for a legal scholar. But uh, I found in fact that when I made the leap that it, it was very productive for me, but I have spent a lot of time struggling with it and, and trying uh, to uh, be, you know, a great law professor and a great fiction writer separately, but union, but making a union of the disciplines turned out to be weirder and greater than I expected. I mean, I don't find it, sorry. No, please go ahead, Carmina, I'll ask later. Oh. Oh, I just wanted to say, like, I don't do not also believe in like the high core specialization ethos. <laughs> I mean, everything that I do has sort of it, it, it's 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 binded by this by the voice, but it goes into different um, into different realms, and I I don't I don't see it as problematic. I don't know. I'm just thinking about it. Sorry, like done. <laughs> Caribbean, do you want to do you want to answer? Oh, she's still up. Okay. All right. Let, let me follow up a little bit here, um, if I may, if that's okay. Um, both of you work in these different modes, right? Um, and perhaps overlapping, but this is something that I was thinking about, Ixta, with your practice. Um, there is a, a shift of voice, I would assume, between writing a law review article for a law journal and writing a fictional article that, that engages with the law. Um, similarly, Carmina, I would assume there is a, a slight shift of voice as well if you're thinking about being a teacher um, versus being a performer for your own work. And so I was curious about how do you know when you want to take which track? So sometimes I do uh, projects, law projects and fiction projects on the same subject. And I don't know, I, I think a lot of people experience this. You just, you sit in front of your medium and you wait to see what's going to happen. And if you learn how to give yourself enough space, then um, you'll, the, the project will explain itself to you. It's obviously you are explaining it to yourself but some kind of transmission is, is occurring um, by which uh, it's, it's kind of a mystery and you're not really sure how it's developing. Um, but if you, it, it starts with a fascination for me and then I just start to lay it out on paper and then the bones appear and then I pursue the figment that I've been able to construct. Um, but sometimes I do I do a, the same top same subject um, in in multiple disciplines. I call it double dipping. <laughs> so. uh, that double dipping. Uh, I mean, it is in my case in particularly. I mean, the teaching practice um, 
I've learned so much about the voice and I really love, but it's very taxing. And in a way it's also like my, my, mo my main survival mode. Um, so in a way I always try to keep it related. And again, that's why I like art before technique. And that's a way that I try to work with the students because art, art is going to lead you to technique and to understand things like that. So I try to like always have those um, things very close so it doesn't feel like separated practices, but as an extension of it. But if I were to be like absolutely honest, like sometimes it's very also because you're dealing with people at the end. And when you're dealing with with people doing art um, at a learning in a learning process that you have to facilitate is, is taxing like like you're not only a, like a technician or like a, an advisor but also um there's an emotional aspect of it and there's like this therapeutic aspect of it because there's a lot of vulnerability so it's very taxing so um if it was to me like i would only do like house space like <laughs> you know and be mostly 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 an artist but in order for me to be bearable with everything it's like then it has to be it has to be an extension and then it has to go along with my ethos of my artistic practice the, the, the teaching so to try to not separate them as much when you're working in an institution it's a little harder because obviously there's all these parameters and there's all these expectations and then education sometimes is getting into that point of um, customer service thing, which is difficult. But when it's people that really want to study with you and work with you, it can be like a both way, really learning le learning and very enriching, but it's also, also very, very taxing. Um, so it's just finding a way to connect them both and not to make like different faces. Because at the end, that's, that's the other thing is like, we are complex, but society wants to make it like it's this or that or this or that or this so in, in that that playing that fucking thing is also very taxing part of my French I think yeah there's a real risk that you're going to be read as incoherent mm -hmm. um and uh disorganized and not committed mm -hmm. so it's it's probably taken me about 25 years to uh get my law school, the, the majority of my law school community to buy into what I'm doing. Um, so that's a little bit of time. Um, but eventually, and it, and, it, and it, you know, you need your elevator pitch too to explain what you're doing to other people. And sometimes you don't, you're just kind of going where the muse is taking you and you're just, you're weaving the things together in a way that you can't always articulate for a long time. Um, but I see that Caribbean is, is able uh, to speak now. So I would I'd like to step back for a second and, and hear her. I think, sorry, I think we're still having a mic issue with Caribbean if you maybe wanna. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so can you guys just hear me uh, the other mic. Here we go. Ah. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. So you can see me maybe through one, but hear me through another one. I'm sorry, it's so confusing. <laughs> That's actually perfect for this question, right? <laughs> what is the question? Well, Amber, um, do you want to restate it again? Oops. Amber. I'm so sorry. I committed the Zoom faux pas. Um, I was just asking about sort of the different roles that you sort of play, right? And so Ixta was talking about, um, you know, how they can, how, taking on these different roles can make people perceive one as being incoherent or not serious. And I was sort of asking about how, um, you know, how you sort of see these different parts of yourself as contributing or, you know, how you negotiate them. And then Amanda was asking how you choose um, which voice to use in which different area. Yeah, I totally feel that. Um, I get a little bit hung up on that too. Um, I worry about whether people will take me seriously as a fiction writer or as a kind of arts journalist or not. Um, but I guess I have different needs in different moments. And I, when everything works out, ideally, one complements the other. So this arts collective that I am part of and that I founded with my husband um, has been really invaluable in helping me launch my, my career, you could call it, it's a weird word, but 
uh, my path as an arts journalist, even though I had started that a long time before that. But what I did is through my arts collective is, and my husband and I started building a platform, a, a publishing platform, and just like a space in the world for artists and for myself as a writer, because I was finding that the spaces that I needed to publish and to be heard and taken seriously as a writer did not exist. Um, I was hustling as a journalist, I was hustling as a fiction writer and not really um, finding any entry points, really. Um, and so we decided that we were gonna do our own thing and that nobody was gonna write about the things that we cared about and nobody else was going to publish them. So we were going to do it ourselves. And so that kind of um, gave new life to um, my my journey as uh, as a cultural critic and as a fiction writer, again, like just by creating spaces on our own. So it depends on on the need. And sometimes um, I don't know, I've had this thing in the last few years where I, I said out loud to myself in the world, I'm gonna walk through the doors that are open to me. And the doors that were being open to me at the time in the last five years have been through arts and cultural journalism. And if I do it well and I care about it. And those are the doors that are being open to me. So I'm gonna keep going with the flow. And, um, and then I was able to return to my fiction um, through the encouragement of friends like Vicky Vertis and other people. And City Lights um, really saw value in my manuscripts of short stories. And that gave me life again. And also through my community of fiction writers um, like Seshu Foster and Ben Ehrenreich, who have really championed my work. And I've, I've had to in a healthy way, rely on my different communities. And I have a couple of them and sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't, but that's okay. So um, I'm able to fall back on these support networks that I've built over time and they're caring and creative people that I treasure. So I don't know if that answers the question, but it's kind of like just feeling my way out sometimes blindly, like through the demands and needs of the time. I think that that's really interesting because that is a huge difference between um, the community that you're describing, um, the opportunities that you're deciding either to make for yourselves or to, to grab for yourselves, and the situation of the art world that Linda Nochlin was writing about, um, about women. She was mostly, of course, writing about art historical women, right? Um, they had no community. Um, what she what she's saying there is that they they were systematically shut out of the opportunity for our community. And so I think that here we're really seeing then a, a huge difference um, between what she was identifying historically and what you're identifying for yourselves and and for your audiences and your participants. Yeah. Certainly uh, small press, and uh, women of color editors have been my lifeline. So, um, so I'll write these crazy. So as a law professor, um, jurisprudence or legal writing is very uh, traditionally um, cabined. It's very restrictive. And I would write uh, pieces of fiction and submit them to law review articles. And there are a bunch of journals about um, women of color, women of color, legal feminism, and those editors in chief, um, often black women, would say, "Yeah, this we're publishing this, and no one else, like no one else, would even touch it." And I and I was uh, encouraged and nourished by this this community of editors in the legal world, uh, where no one else would touch my work, and. Um, in fiction writing, in writing about some of the things that I've been uh, documenting, I've been writing about Trump politics, and now also, uh, and I, I have to, I just have to 
this is this is the cover of my book that I'm coming out with, and and it's from Triquarterly Books, and uh, this is my my publisher uh, for the forthcoming book. So it's about art, and uh, this has also been a real lifeline for me as well. Uh, editors who uh, are really um, encouraging and open-minded. That's what that's what you need, and what and what we should be as well. We talk about and multiple hats. But then talking about this community, and again, it's like making reference, like I'm surrounded by badass, badass women who have nothing handed to them. So precisely because of that, it creates like such a strong community. Like I can just kind of think like Eva Aguila, like Laura Gutierrez, I see her around there in the, um, Daniela Lieja, like all Latinx women, like like that are working really freaking hard. And, um, and, not, and, and again, because, that system so we're creating the new systems and I think that's that's empowering agreed and I think I just keep thinking of um two two writers that I really admire and they're Grace Paley and Mary Oppen and over the years, I've been learning more about their lives. Um, Grace Paley was a fiction writer, short story. She was a mother, but she was also a hardcore activist. And writing was important to her, but it was not the number one thing. Making a just um, a world and fighting for the world she wanted to live in was really important to Grace Paley. And also to uh, the poet Mary Oppen and she and her husband, um, stopped writing for years to uh, fight Nazis and fascists and do all kinds of things, organize with workers. And I find their work to be not just on the page, but also in the way they lived. And again, the way they built community in the world and the way they fought and worked to shape the world they live in. So. I think about those things and wonder for myself, like what that might look like, again, given the world that we live in and the, the, the craziness that we experience and the catastrophes we experience, like how does it, what does it mean to maybe not always make work on the page, but find a way of, of living in the world that is also meaningful and gratifying and as a person who also cares a lot about aesthetics, I heard Carmina talk about the importance of aesthetics. Like, what is that? These are questions, not, I'm not trying to answer anything, but like, how do we bring and aestheticize, how do we bring aesthetics into this world that we're actively trying to um, shape into something livable? And um, these are just questions that I'm always asking myself. And I look to the lives of, of artists and writers such as Grace Paley and Mary Oppen um, for, I don't know, for ways to be when I'm not necessarily able to sit in front of the laptop or at the page to make the work. I can just jump in. I think that that Caribbean's point is so important uh, to create a, a hagiography or a lineage uh, or an imaginary of artists who have gone before us or are working now who have gone through rough times, maybe stop making work or wherever, have a pause, have a hiatus, um, and to see what became of them. So I became interested in Rosa Rolanda in part because it appears that she stopped making work altogether. But I did a bunch of research on, on lots of different artists. Another one uh, who I became very interested in is a, a Black female sculptor um, who I believe died in the 1960s, Meta Va Warwick Fuller, who was a sculptor who uh, was working in the late 1800s, deep 1900s. She has had a very long career. Um, she was mentored by Rodin and uh, she exhibited in Paris in 1900. And um, she was a really incredible realist uh, as well as kind of proto surrealist sculptor. I think that Anya has an image. Um, of her work um, of a, a person talking to an ancestor or talking to a skull. I don't know if we can bring that up, but regardless. So she was this really productive uh, sculptor, but she stopped making work, it appears twice. 
right, Meta uh, Va Warwick Fuller, Talking Skull, you can see here um, someone speaking to the dead, speaking mm -hmm. to their ancestors. Um, Fuller was uh, certainly mentored by the greats, but she was also uh, responded to with hostility and even anxiety by a uh, white supremacist art critical in uh, community um, who thought that her work was uh, antagonistic and uh, they didn't support her. And she nevertheless continued making work. And uh, as Amber was talking about, I mean, she, in, in through large swaths of her career, she fulfilled this iconic status as the persevering, persisting female artist, continuing work in the face of diversity. Uh, but she uh, did stop making work, it appears, twice, one in 19, uh, once in 1910 when her house or studio burned down and a lot of her work was destroyed. And then also in the 1950s uh, when uh, she kind of began to succumb to tuberculosis as did her husband and she was dealing with childcare and her husband wasn't supporting her as much as he, sh he uh, should have. But eventually she was able uh, to uh, uh, close her life and her career by making some great work um, uh, commemorating the civil rights movement. And uh, I think it's a good idea to, to think about um, and structure and give daylight and language uh, to uh, these experiences in one's art career when um, you, everything drains out and uh, the world becomes too difficult to make art in. And that, um, as, as both Caribbean and Garamina have been talking about, community, um, uh, thinking about different roles as Amber has talk, talked about, as Amanda has talked about, thinking about interdisciplinary uh, strategies and, and to think about our ancestors are all uh, techniques that we might be able to look to to get through what uh, for many is an in, is a um, inchoate, uh, languageless, uh, frustrating, and even desperate period in an artist's career. And that's that's my bit on Fuller. I think now we can move on to the. Um... The Q and A if there are questions that people have. Yeah, um, I actually I love uh, Caribbean and Lisa. I feel like what you just touched on um, really resonates with a question we have um, from Serena Caffrey, who can't read uh, for herself and has asked me to read uh, this question. Um, Serena has been thinking a lot about the intersections of compulsion and care in her own practice, and this conversation about endurance as a display of perseverance and tenacity versus a response to habitual overworking is really getting her thinking. She loves the way that Carmina and Caribbean talked about the many identities present in their creative practices. What other artistic work, materials, places, et cetera, do the artists pr present turn to for their own uh, nurturance and reinvigoration? When do you know when you need to turn off your practice and nurture other identities and relationships, re being a mother, a community member, a human? Thank you, Serena. That's a really hard one for me because I don't. I sometimes do not know how to turn that off. <laughs> and sometimes I wonder, like, <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm so focused right now. Um, and what what happens when um, when that identity that you have created for yourself is not there, like in the downtime. So it's a thing that I'm like questioning constantly, like to me it's incredibly hard to turn it off. Yeah. Um, that's, that is a hard question, especially for me right now, because we're all, um, I, I have my entire family in the house 24 seven. And uh, it's hard to turn everything, to turn things off because everybody, I just feel like I'm on all the time. Everybody's on all the time. Um, I'm exhausted. I mean, there's just no other way of saying it. I, I, I'm looking for a break and I know my husband's in the other room listening. He knows this, so it's not a surprise to anybody, but um, I think um, these are not normal times. 
and in more normal times, um, it's still hard, but I, I try to turn it off. Like I just try, I, by now I know what are my, my oases that I can turn to. Um, and I know where to go and natural spaces that I can go to, to help me um, reinvigorate and sort of chill out and re-nourish myself. It's hard to access those spaces right now because of pandemic and all that. But um, I don't know. I think it's just hard. I don't know what else to say. But it, it is sometimes a break to to turn off one identity and one role and jump into something else and just sort of immerse yourself in that. Um, like, yeah. Uh, but right now everything's just so jumbled up together at once and I'm constantly like running, trying to catch up with anything that it's harder to do. Um, I, I decided that I would, I was describing it as pivoting, um, but I also learned that if you pivot too much, then it can cause dizziness and nausea. Yeah. So right, you don't want to just constantly be pivoting. So when do you when do you do it? I, I probably go too far. I mean, Carmina's uh, comments about the sense of anxiety and loss of an identity if you're not making art is is very resonant with me. There's there's a certain spectrum of anxiety running undercurrent running beneath sometimes my practice and I and I know that that fuels it but it can also um, malfunction and I can glitch in ways that are not helpful to me so I probably took it too far I finally uh, now I see it as just taking a break where I was gathering right the, then you reconstruct these narratives oh I was just taking a break and I was gathering information and I was strengthening myself and now I'm ascending and it's just a triumphant story of resilience and success and I here's my book and blah 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 but at the time what it felt like is spiritual and creative death and uh, that I had to grieve and uh, that um, it was over and this wasn't working for, any, for me anymore um, and that's when I stopped and when I started again um, was, so I'll just briefly talk about, uh, I started again because of Slurpees, um, because I was in a hospital stay in 2015 where I couldn't eat or drink anything for five days. Mm -hmm. And so I began to hallucinate about Slurpees, as you do. Slurpees, ices, big gulps, right? Coca-Cola. When I was conscious, I, I got a Pinterest account on my phone and I would pin all these pictures of Slurpees and I would show them to the nurses and the nurses would nod wisely at me. I mean, I was just like, I was just losing my mind. And uh, when I finally got back from the hospital, I was sitting on my sofa and I thought, you got nothing to lose. You got nothing to lose you should just start making work again because it's all good and you're alive, it's gravy. So I just went into the catastrophe. I put on a coat and I called a lift. Uh, they took me to the 7-Eleven. I got a Slurpee. It was disgusting. <laughs> I came home and I wrote a bitter and elegant essay about Slurpees. And I submitted it to a web journal and they, they published it. And then I thought, right, right, writing. And I just started again. So I just, I went, I went into, the, into the catastrophe and I wrote about it, but it took me about, took me several years to do it. I stopped when it just, it hurt past the point of being helpful. And I started again when I had nothing else to lose. <laughs> I love that story, Ixta. Um, and the next question is actually for me and I think connects because I'm, I'm thinking about embodiment. Um, you know, I really appreciate that we started this conversation with two readings and then a, a meditation, which I feel like was so needed for me just to settle into my body. And um, so rare kind of in like conversations like this or more kind of, 
I mean, the Brooklyn Rail, I wouldn't call like a traditional <laughs> art space, but you know, um, in like an academic space or like a gallery space or a, or a museum. So I'm thinking about uh, kind of how you all, and I think it kind of connects to the conversation we're having about specialization and interdisciplinary practice a little bit, you know, bringing the personal, bringing the embodied experience, bringing the, the hallucinations about Serpies into an essay. Um, and just wondering how, how you find yourself uh, how you find that work received. Um, and uh, if you think that's kind of like a point of entry towards, you know, talking about feeling like uh, your work, uh, interdisciplinary work, it's been really hard to, to uh, convince or whatever, get your peers to like see the value in that. I don't know, it feels like it is a point to bring people together and say like, we're grounding here and then moving out. And I just I'm wondering about your experience with, with that idea of the embodied. So when you talk about the, so just to clarify the question, you're talking about interdisciplinary work as it exists in an embodied space? Or I'm thinking not necessarily, sorry, I guess that was confusing to, to bring that back oh, in. Just thinking about like, I, the, the interdisciplinary, I think like opens up the possibilities for like new ways of thinking about just uh, for thinking about like the academy, like what is, what can we write in an essay? It doesn't have to be like so formulaic. You can open up uh, an essay or you know a dissertation or something with some like a personal essay or a poem, or include like you know vocalization or performance in a theor uh, and that pairs with like theory. And I think so much of that has to do with bringing like in one's embodied experience. Um, and I don't know, I just felt like today, uh, not, not a clash, but like just having a moment to kind of drop in, uh, in a space like this is, it was, I, I really appreciated it. And I think it almost gives a more, um, like a possibility for, for a place, for peers who might necess not necessarily see the value in the interdisciplinary or in the, the personal narrative to, to open up, or maybe it's not even just about the peers receiving it, but that kind of tension. I'm, I'm just interested in, in that, in, in, yeah. I mean, because I was just trying to like think about and like just to sort of like connect through, through, the, through the ideas. And um, I mean, I guess get, because the, the, the word catastrophe has like uh, been popping up a lot of, of the times. And I did have like a personal catastrophe, like a very painful separation around like four or five years ago, I don't even remember. But what happened after that, because when everything breaks down, it's like a way that you can find more honesty towards yourself and with what you want and what you're doing and how do you understand your body itself. Um, and then, and then these, um, because once you, you lost it all, or that, what, what you think it was your all, um, then you don't give a damn. And I find, I have found that, I mean, in the, in the process of voice, or if I'm embodying my voice, like the process of like getting, when you are vulnerable and like own that vulnerability, and then, and I'm, again, I'm like, I, I course like, uh, I'm like a sailor. Like once you don't give a fuck. And that I say that to my students too, it's like, that's one of the primordial things. But in order to get into the state, um, some things have, have to happen. But once you once you get into that, it's like easier to embody because like that's the body and you don't give up, you don't give a, a damn about like what's, what's outside of it. And then you feel freer. And again, because you are, um, in these, it, and, it, and don't give a fuck doesn't mean like, I don't, you don't care. It's you don't care about this specific response or this specific love, because we all are like beings that want, want to have these like very profound needs that want to be satisfied and that profound like fears to not have those things satisfied. But once you like gone through something, let it seep through you, survive it, 
and then just start like, and then you it's, it's better to connect. It, it allows you to have more intense connections to reality and to the other. But that's like in the way to embody it. I, I do think it's like it's a big uh, like fuck you to the to the and it's not a violent thing, but it is, and in a way it is a violent thing because you have to transgrade like those preconceptions in order to be free, you know. And then it doesn't matter where, whether you're like in academia or blah 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 blah. Because also that's the thing like the, the the artists that we love the most or at least in performance are the ones that are the most vulnerable and allow. For those spaces to be. Um, if I may just jump in very quickly, um, if we have time for other questions, we will. But I just wanted to, I, I'm and thinking about what everybody's saying, Carmina and Ixta and you, Anya, I'm thinking about the body as something that I'm always interested in um, interrogating. And I find it to be like a very intelligent document that I can always turn to and if I'm not able to turn to it and I'm not able to to read it um there's something there then that I know that has to happen there's something off and I need to turn to the body to my body as a way to to learn about all kinds of things I mean I feel like our body's connected not just to the present moment that we're living in, the environment that we're experiencing, um, but also to our history and our past. And I'm very personally uh, interested in um, like intergenerational knowledge and how that's carried through the body. And that's something that I've explored through my writing as well. Um, and it's in my new book, but I, that's th that's something that that I feel like I can investigate through my body at any time. Um, and I'm always going to learn and see something different depending on where I am and what's going on. So I feel like an embodied practice is just really vital for me. And it's always been that way. Um, um, maybe I'll just stop there and just leave it at that for now. Yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, in terms of the body um, and uh, different types of practice, uh, just building upon the responses of everyone, um, I think that points of access for work and thought can exist both in uh, bodily disintegration and or, uh, or some sort of bodily trauma, as well as in the construction of the embodied self, that bo in both of these experiences um, exist uh, points of access, information. Um, uh, what uh, Caribbean is talking about is a document to read. Um, I've already given my story about how physical um, annihilation uh, later, it relates to Carmina's point about not giving a fuck. You just, you're, you're even a new kind of feral uh, space where suddenly things are are possible that didn't seem possible before because you're in a you are you have been moved out of uh, the world as you understood it before. These these experiences of trauma give you new knowledge, uh, new awareness, and once you can collect yourself, you might be able to translate them. And then also um, these binaries uh, and these categories are in fact artificial. And uh, as uh, women of color, as queer women, um, as intersectional women, we know that um, from the day we arrive at consciousness and that within our, our flourishing also exists this information that these categories are, are made to be questioned and even um, dismembered. Thank you so much for those answers. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I wish we had time uh, to to ask or you know answer all the questions and, and address every comment. We have to wind down the Q and A. So our last uh, question will come from uh, the publisher at the Rail, Fang Gui. Uh, Fang, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Yeah. 
Thank you, you guys. Thank you so much, Ista. Thank you, Kamina. Thank you, Caribbean. Thank you, our brilliant um, art editor, Amanda. Amber Mills is always a delight to see her also joining in. So I, I have no nothing to ask. It's just been delightful and um, and I just heard Grace Pelly's name mentioned um, that you brought up Caribbean. And I just wanna share that I have a privilege to have dinner with her and her husband, Robert Nichols at Dory Aston's home. And I also met her later in Vermont through Paul Maddox, our few notes editor's mother, um, Isa. So it's just so incredible that whole uh, generation, you know, it's hard to identify what she did. I mean, I have a beautiful signed copy of her little uh, disturbances of men, but she was everything. She was a feminist, she was an anti-war activist. She was a, one of the great short story writer, teacher, poet. Uh, it's hard to imagine. I mean, you mentioned Mary Open the same, you know. I think the idea for us is to be fearless about not allowing people labor so easily. And the other thing, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Grace Pelly and Mary Open too, because they have an incredible community in which they rely on. Uh, and that's what lacking today because many of us are being sent and sit comfortably or not uncomfortably in the academy. So we think the academy is a context of our community, which is not true. As you know, if you form one department, you have to compete for the same funding pool to the next. You put together in one room, you will kill each other. So that's not exactly a community. So this is a formal community and it's not traditional. We have to go outside of the norm, tradition. The rail is not a traditional um, context of what all of us coming together for. But I just want to mention that, you know, um, one of the things that inspired us to do, I just share with you very incredibly um, circumstance that is really surprising. It's just a, a mere, um, I would say outdoor market on Sixth Avenue that I bought this complete copy of this of a magazine is called the seven arts it's only existed in one year 1916 to 17 um and it, it, it i just love the editorial it simply say it's not a magazine for artists but an, it's an expression of the artist for the community and that's basically what we are trying to do here we bring all this all the the arts together no longer allowing the, anyone to separate us, you know? So, and I think your concern is, is well heard and we can continue to work and collaborate together. And the other thing which is so wonderful is that we allow in this platform so that older artists or poets or writers, um, you mentioned those people, obviously Grace Pelly and Mary Oppen, and this is the, there's few of them are still with us. So it is our aspiration, it's our duty to reach out to them, to, to get their wisdom. And I think that's what we are doing also. So uh, we can work together um, from now on, essentially. So thank you so much. And uh, delightful that you can join us in this context and I'm sure we can continue further. Um, so I think we'll again hand it back to you. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Fang. Thank you for that insight about uh, the need for community building outside the academy. Um, absolutely agree. And I think, um, I don't know, yeah, the, the new social environment, common ground, uh, something that really, I feel like is another way we get embodied is uh, in our tradition of ending these conversations with a poetry reading. Um, it's something that we've done before, um, you know, entering the Zoom world and we've carried that tradition into community events um, and today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate um, Angel Dominguez. Uh, Angel is a Latinx poet and artist of Yucatec Maya descent born in Hollywood and raised in Van Nuys California by their immigrant family. They're the author of Rose Sun Water and Black Lavender Milk. Their third book Desgraciado, the, the Collected Letters, is forthcoming from Nightboat Books 
Uh, so Angel, I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for this wonderful conversation and event. Carmina, thank you for that meditation. I needed that so much. I didn't realize how much I was like carrying in my neck and body. Also just thinking about sort of the intergenerational trauma that we all carry through our RNA, right? It's always very present with us, um, especially in this like vast chaotic net of Latinidad, whatever that even means anymore. Like I'm not gonna, I am here to read poems. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I do just want to say like, thank you everyone for being here. This was very resonant, very nourishing. Um, and it's very, um, it's just, it reminded me of a lot. And I'm, I'm grateful for this community and sort of these disembodied spaces in which so many can come together to weave new forms of knowledge. Um, so I just, I have three very quick poems for you all. Um, I probably should be reading from like one of the books that's coming out, but um, you all inspired me. And so in thinking about how we keep on keeping on, um, I write revenge poems. <laughs> um, so this one is actually in uh, Pro Lit Mag online. You can find it with a few other ones and it's called The Last Billionaire Died Today. No one could hear that last breath over the sound of everyone eating. Okay, so short poem, right? Um, so here's another poem. It's called A Remedy Among Many. Eat the heart of your oppressor with an habanero. Add some limon y sal to taste. Empty out every prison. Open community gardens where they once existed. I do not understand the gestures of capital, and I have only seen success in our survival y mi amor. How we survive is a song of reckoning. And I will just end with this last poem. Um, it's called Hatchback Truths. These are all from an in-progress manuscript that might come out in 2024. Who knows? We'll see about this apocalypse. So hatch Hatchback Truths. I pour a mile of wet concrete into my mouth. I call it a city. Call the pack back together. Call the night to a cumbia rhythm. I've only ever been good at paycheck math, like the overdraft shuffle or this many miles and this much gasoline and how to scheme thieving time away from a job in such a way that we might grow older or you could hatch back the whole thing. Call me what I am. Call me by way of all night highway. Call me where you are going. Call me my mother's, 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 mother's name. Call me forever. Call me morning of wild turkeys and trees. Call me in love. I have this game where I scream at a bank until one of us breaks and I have yet to win, but they haven't either. And this uncertainty like a quark, well, it keeps me smiling from graveyard shift to cold coffee to taxi to the sky. And they don't understand that it is us rising up with the waters. They still think they'll live to see an actual horizon like it's a place. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Angel. That was amazing. Um, but I feel like that was a perfect way to close out our event. So thank you. And thank you, Ixta, Carmina, Caribbean, Amanda, and Amber. Uh, thank you all who tuned in today. And thank you for your questions and your uh, comments in the chat. Um, before we go, just want to say that this October marks the Rails 20th anniversary. Um, we're going to be celebrating that anniversary all the way into 2021. So please consider making a year end contribution to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent uh, projects like uh, the Common Ground series, the new social environment and the We the Immigrants project. Every amount matters to us. Uh, our goal is to double last year's participation and reach 500 donors. So I'll uh, put a link in the chat for more information or you could ask one of our team members. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation between Kate Fowle, Helen Lee, and uh, Joaquin Pissarro. And we'll conclude with a poetry reading from Coco Sophia Fitterman. And now you should be able uh, to unmute yourselves and uh, say goodbye and thank you.
Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Carmina. Thank you, Caribbean. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Caribbean. Thank you. Caribbean, thank you for being so resilient today. You were on the move and oh, you yeah. made it work. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so Keep much. Keep on keeping thank you on. All. Yeah. <laughs> this was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you, you guys. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.